Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of It's a Wonderful Podcast. It is episode 63, and no, I'm afraid to say Janine will not be joining us this week, even though she is taking over the whole feed, as we all know. But we have another returning guest for this week, for episode 63. It has been her, it's her choice of movie this week, and... You know, I trust her when it comes to anything musical related, or really anything really. I mean, she's a very trustworthy person in general. Um, for her first time since Musical March. So I guess it's not that long, but it's also like, you're the musical queen. Rachel Silverstrini, hello. Hello. Of course I had to pick a musical, and it's my favourite, well... It's definitely up there. It's definitely top three. Love, love, love this musical. So that's top three musicals or top three movies? Musicals. It's Does definitely it up there. In overall movies? Absolutely. Okay. Probably, is, probably uh... top ten. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and tell the good listeners which movie you did pick for episode 63 of this ridiculous show? So episode 63 is all about 1955's The Court Jester. Yes. And it is epic. It stars Danny Kaye, um, who is one of the best actors, I think, of all time. He is especially one of the best comedic actors. He is stunning and funny and just overall a pleasure to watch. You may uh, you may be offended by this statement. The only other Danny Kay movie I have seen is White Christmas. <gasps> you now, haven't even seen Holiday Inn. No. Now this is now the Court oh, Jester, which it, which we will get into because I also kind of absolutely adored this movie in every conceivable way. Um, for all just for all the right reasons, I think it just kind of really worked. Um, but yeah, only the, only the second movie of Danny Kay, I believe I have ever seen. Um, but he was a delight. I would definitely recommend, uh, obviously White Christmas, uh, Holiday Inn, uh, Hans Christian Andersen is so delightful. Um, he plays Hans Christian Andersen. I'm sorry? Of course it is. It's... It's Danny Kay. Is the it would be like that right? putting the rock in a movie that doesn't have an explosion. Like it's just kind of a waste. I mean, that's a fair statement. Is the is this Hans Christian Andersen movie a musical about all the Hans Christian Andersen characters? Uh, it's about the writer as he is creating all of his stories. Um, it okay. is actually something that I used to watch a lot as a child. I actually haven't watched it recently, and I really should now that I'm talking about it, because I adore it. Uh, it was one of my favorites as a child, and it is just wonderful. I mean, I'm into it. I like that <laughs> a lot. But, but Danny Kaye is not the only star of this movie. We no, have he is not. A, a, quite a good little cast that they've got going on here. I mean, the casting was fantastic, especially for 1955. Um, Basil Rathbone is... Basil Rathbone. Amazing. Is, he is also... Basil Rathbone, also a, a, a current member of the Mustache Hall of Fame, which is a renowned, revered, huge thing on this whole Absolutely. feed. He would go in for this performance as well, but once you are in the Mustache Hall of Fame, you are in it for life, regardless of what further mustaches you may or may not have. Uh, Basil Rathbone, I also view as a slightly less silly Vincent Price. Not only because he looks um, like Vincent Price, but also I he, that. he has the same sort of presence that someone like Vincent Price has, but also seems to take everything a bit more villainously and a bit more seriously. Uh, can have I, a joke every now and again, but 
isn't kind of hasn't got the you know there's something he's less tongue-in-cheek far less tongue-in-cheek that's exactly what i'm trying to say um yeah far less tongue-in-cheek about price it's why i kind of love him so much yeah, um, I, but i, I also I, love basil rathbone i think that basil and vincent are very very similar like it, it's like when you take a like a jewel and you look through one facet and then you turn it and you look through another yeah. and it's the same image but slightly distorted i think that that's basil and vincent they also can both pull off phenomenal facial hair oh, which is always a bonus yes it's always a always a bonus for me there's a reason we have the hall of fame on yeah. this show well, this movie was actually Basil's last sword fight on film. Um, That's he was a big deal. He was an accomplished swordsman. Um, uh, he was in a ton of movies, um, not just um, as an actor, but as a stunt coordinator and fight supervisor. And this was the last one that he was on. And apparently during his big fight scene towards the end, which we will get to, um, he... <laughs> He was in his late 60s, and they had to bring in the actual stunt guy to complete some of the faster moves because Danny Kay was not a trained swordsman. <laughs> and so Basil almost, he said he almost got skewered by Danny Kay a few times in some oh, of the tapings. Yes. So on the front facing scenes, obviously it's Basil. And then on some of the back end where Danny Kay is literally waving his sword over his head and acting erratically that would be the stunt coordinator and the fight consultant admit admittedly basil rathbone does not look like he's in his late 60s in this movie no he doesn't well he, i mean they didn't have all the chemicals and the food back then so no i guess and of course uh shot in glorious vista vision makes everything look better um oh, God, vista vision. you know i always love whether it's vista vision or cinema scope or, or anything like that. I always love saying glorious in, in front of it. Even technical, oh. glorious technical. Um, just I mean, because it is, movies. It's, it's not just a word, it's, it, it applies. Yeah. It, it, it is a, uh, it's a feeling. It's not just, it's not just a, a technical um, pr production method. It is it's a feeling. A, a technical movie feels like not, 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 an, not every other you know, movie in colour. If it's technicolor, yeah. there's a feeling to it. And that's what I always love. That is why I always use the word glorious, because it elevates <laughs> everything. And it does. Um, it's great. But yeah, I love Basil Rathbone in this. I always love Basil Rathbone playing these uh, villainous, conniving kind of guys, very similar to uh, his uh, guy of, of Gisborne in Robin Hood from the 30s. Oh, absolutely. Which uh, um, which we did on this show, and I believe is the film that got Basil into the Mustache Hall of Fame. So, uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Another and glorious I mean, mustache. How can we talk about this glorious cast without mentioning the phenomenal and stunningly beautiful Angela Lansbury? Angela Lansbury is like, a treasure to all. She's also a dish in this movie like that girl looks good she is gorgeous i mean i i don't disagree she's also a little bit of a broad in this like, oh she is she knows what she's going for she okay so just for for the listeners who haven't heard of or watched this movie uh so the premise is very simple uh this guy yeah. kills all of the royals um in the royal family uh, for Lund for england and takes over the throne uh there is it's kind of um it's kind of uh like anastasia where there's a child apparently that has lived who has the birthmark of the purple pimpernel which is a red uh, it's a purple flower <laughs> birthmark on his little butt um, and yeah. so there, there are the rebels who have this child that are trying to protect him and overthrow the king. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so th that's one of the storylines. And that's where Danny Kay comes in. He plays this guy who's trying to get in to uh, help overthrow the king. Uh, and he poses as Giacomo, king of jesters and jester to the king. 
uh, while... Which is a great title, and it's a title that I want to take up for myself. Where's the king? Where's the king? Can I be his jester? <laughs> well, I mean, you better get employed because, you know, an unemployed jester is nobody's fool. One of my yeah, favorite that's lines. True. That is um, true. And so all of this goes down, and in the meantime, there in the in the castle, there is also uh, uh, Griswold from the north wants to marry the princess, and the king wants to allow this so that there is an alliance. Um, and in the king's men, uh, in his trusted advisors, um, Basil, who plays uh, oh my god, I just had his name. Ra- in my head. Uh, what, what was his name? Ravenswood. Ravenhurst. 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 Sir Ravenhurst. Which just sounds like a bad guy name, just Raven. Well, when you've when you've got Raven in your name, it's never going to go well, is it? You're always going to nah. be some sort of evil person or a witch or some sort of cool goth person. I don't know. And, and speaking <laughs> of witches, the princess has her own witch. She I does. I love her. Uh, she's great. She's is her name great. Griselda. Griselda. Is that her name? Griselda. She's great. Griswold. Ravenhurst. Uh, the princess is Gwendolyn. This is just one of my favorite groupings of names. Um, <laughs> I mean, so admittedly, in... when um, w- when the king is it King Roderick? Yes. Because this is like some sort of pseudo Middle Ages Britain, right? Yeah. Um, so King Roderick uh, insists that his daughter Angela Lansbury, uh, the great Angela Lansbury, marries uh, uh, Sir Griswold from the north. Now. Yeah. Uh, it can't have just been me that was expecting Chevy Chase to turn up. <laughs> you would have been really young. Um, no, if Chevy Chase... <laughs> if a <laughs> nine-year-old Chevy Chase turned up in this movie saying, Hello, I'm Mr. Griswold. That's fair. And, um, I don't know. That was just a silly joke. And... Uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't think of the name Griswold without thinking of Chevy Chase's stupid Clark. face. That's fair, but this movie <laughs> is so great in the fact that if you take away the musical aspect of it and you take away like the little humorous moments, this is a very dark film <laughs> because there's so much yeah. backstabbing and conniving and plans, and there's a witch and poison and death and you know, royalty overthrowing and murders and rebellions. And it's really a, it seems like a very simple film when you like, you're like, Oh, it's a musical made in the fifties, but then you watch it and you're like, there's a lot going on here and you really have to engage, but it, it's such a light concept. Like it just seems like a very light and fun movie. But then if you really start to get into it, there's a lot of layers to it. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of plotting going on, and of course, me and uh, me and Janine did the Lion in Winter a couple of episodes which is... ago, which is again royalty, all about yeah. plotting. Uh, Obviously, a kind of a more dramatic movie than than this one. Yeah. This is got way more comedic elements to it, and like you said, it's but a there, musical, but, but it's the but same the s- sort of. It is thing. the same. It's the same movie, but with. Danny Kay <laughs> and lightheartedness and l- like beautiful, beautiful costumes that you now, know are big and bright and it's it's yeah. it's it's just so gorgeous. But yeah, it's it's a very dark premise with all of these beautiful light nuances to it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying about the color as as well. You said so bright and so vivid and just beautiful to look at, and mm-hmm. it does always have that it does always uh you know cause that little bit of intrigue for a viewer when they are watching this when they are watching it a movie like this that's you know a period movie set in old england with all these lavish costumes and big sets brightness it's a musical but then like you said you do have this dark twisty uh subtle uh, plotting story it's not subtle they're plotting in the middle of the hallways like <laughs> well um, yeah it's i mean that's so, yeah. true but there's 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 literally nothing there's very few things that are like it's a very cloak and dagger type movie but like without like the overveiled secrecy like nobody's like 
there's like one scene where they're like to my chambers to talk and it's like oh you're plotting cool um you you quoted that like that and i must say that near enough every line in the movie is spoken like that absolutely um and that just makes it so much better um but not but not only is the plot and all of that good but the songs are just so perfect for this movie they are they are there is there is wordplay in this movie that is just staggering to watch I'm I'm going to say this and I know it's a bold statement but I'm pretty sure that Danny Kay was the Lin Manuel Miranda of the 50s. I mean, I don't know enough about musicals, musical theater coming from you, I would trust that statement. This is all on Rachel. I am uh, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to musicals, I am a uh, I enjoy musicals. I do not know. I do not even begin to know anything compared to the likes of you so i will leave such statements up to you have you listened to any hamilton tracks not really no (laughs) okay sorry well it's it's i will i will let you know it it is it the wordplay and the speed of which the songs are sung are very similar um obviously none of there's no rapping in uh court jester (laughs) was a little before its time um but i would be most displeased if there was <laughs> but i mean to be fair if you in the in the scene where uh danny k has to perform as the jester uh for the king yeah. with a great hall full of people and he sings the song about how he became a jester um mm-hmm. it is a very rapidly rapidly paced song um with not a lot of singing so you could kind i mean it's it's it, it, you can you can make the case for it, but I mean it's very um, it's so perfectly done, and Danny Kay is such a beautiful um, Danny Kay is such a beautifully put together actor that he can go from one character to another in a literally in the snap of a finger, which he has to do well. Yeah. Literally in this movie, um, it's a very good choice gets... of words there, Rachel. Thanks, babe. Uh, it's a very good choice of words. <laughs> so one of the plot points in this is when, uh, so when Gwen, uh, Princess Gwendolyn, finds out that she is to be betrothed to uh, Clark Griswold. Uh, to Griswold, um, she says one of my favorite lines that I've ever heard in a movie. And the uh, the king is telling her, you know, um, uh, that she is going to marry this king and how it would please him. And um, and she says, if it pleases you so much, you marry Griswold. <laughs> and every time I hear it, like this is probably I because I rewatched it again for this uh, recording. Mm-hmm. Um, it was probably like my hundredth, hundred fiftieth time. It still <laughs> makes me laugh, and it's one of those things that I think watching it as a small like as a young girl um was always like oh she's talking back to her dad who's the king like she's kind of a badass um but then she threatens she gets to her room and she talks to uh her witch and basically tells her that if i she's like "I'm, i'm either gonna die or you're finding a way out of this for us because if i die you die and so in order to get out of it the witch tells her that her great love is on his way while Danny Kay is rolling up to the castle, claims that he's her love, and then bewitches him to go seduce her um, and says that he is under her spell until she snaps her fingers. So this great scene happens when he, you know, he flies onto her balcony by riding on a vine which is so ridiculous yeah i mean i'm not (laughs) quite sure how that managed to work especially with the way it was shot it seemed like it was kind of far where's that vine come from it's the side of a castle on the sea Um, he also grabs it and doesn't like do a test tug he just grabs it off of the wall and just like swings um but yeah swings in and says my fair princess, hello. It is so theatrical. 
the it's whole so movie. It's so cheesy and so much fun. But he basically convinces her that uh, he is there to woo her and rescue her. And she gets... Uh, her, her dad comes in and threatens her uh, and she ends up snapping her fingers and it snaps Danny Kay out of this like trance that he's been put in and he turns back into into himself and he gets scared and doesn't know where he is and then her father snaps his fingers and every time they snap he changes from this scared un like uncertain guy to Giacomo this <laughs> brave champion of lovers and just so charming and everything but every time they snap he he physically changes his face and i don't know how he does it and you can see the transformation instantly yeah. and watching that scene is like watching a master class on just embodying caricature um yeah. and, and then it, you know he gets out of the room and it's 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 just so good I mean, near 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 enough everything, honestly about about this movie and the performances and everything is so impressive to watch. But scenes like that are so funny. They are so funny to watch. Physic, it's physical comedy. It is pure physical comedy in those I sort mean, of scenes. I mean, not um, even like, and he masters not even just the physical comedy, like the scene when he and uh, the captain of the guard. Are I was talking about to bring with, when they get when they get pulled over. Yeah, I was about to posing. just bring that up. Yeah, so Danny Kay has to pose as an old man to uh, escort the captain of the rebels, who is actually played by a female by Janice Johns, who plays Maid Jean, who is. St- stunning and a badass um and she becomes kind of like you know the love interest but whatever she still like holds her own like god bless the 50s for making women that are just like full of moxie you know right um right you get two big ones in this yeah you do um but she poses as uh danny k's like granddaughter who's deaf and they're trying to esc- like they have the child hidden in the uh, in the wine cart as they're trying to get to the, the the castle and they get pulled over and the captain of the guard comes down and starts. <laughs> there's like this three and a half minute scene yeah. where he's trying to talk to the girl to get answers <laughs> and see if they found like the rebels in the forest. And Danny K is playing this old man who can't hear. And then the, <laughs> the captain of the guard just starts screaming at him. He's like, no need to yell. I can hear <laughs> just fine. And it's it's things like that that just don't get used in comedies anymore. Mainly, yeah. I think because there's just nobody who can make it believable or good like that anymore. I I tend to agree with that. I it, it, that scene had me in hysterics. <laughs> I... What took so long? Stutters. <laughs> yeah, just doing all the sign language. Yeah. What did she, what did she say? He said, no. No. (laughs) What took so long? What took so long? Stutters. Stutters. (laughs) It's just stupid little things like that. Um, But it's so effective and And so... It it takes so long for them to get a single answer. And it just, at the end, the, you know, the the leader, like you said, the captain or whatever it is, the leader of the, uh, the royal... Oh, the, know, cap- uh, the, the captain of the guard? Yeah. yeah. They, um, he, just, he just is so frustrated. After, so... after two things, and I mean, he just gets louder and louder he... and just starts shouting at him up to the that point can... where, like you said, Danny Kate just says, okay, there's no need to shout. Calm <laughs> down. I can, I can hear just fine. <laughs> um... <laughs> But actually, the captain of the of the the royal guard is actually one of my favorite characters to watch in the movie because I've seen it so many times. I will literally focus on a different character each time I watch it, just oh, yeah. because there's so much that goes on. There's so many things happening in the background, and the captain of the guard just makes me laugh so hard because he's so stern and yeah. so serious all the time, and he's constantly like, so he sees Danny Kay. As the old man, and then when he gets introduced to him as Giacomo, he literally just like is staring him down. He goes, "Haven't we met before?" And he goes, "No, I just came from Italy." And he goes, "Okay, 
I know you from somewhere, but like he's just constantly just like mean mugging Danny Kay, and it is one of my favorite things. It's so good. Like throughout oh. the entire movie, he's like, I swear I've met him before. Yeah. Um literally, that's kind of all he does in the whole movie. He just says, yeah. I've seen you before about and eight then he, times. And then he barks at people and it's funny. Like I don't it is funny. It's just it's just good. Can we talk about how great funny. the 50s were for... We can. Oh, for movies. What's, what's, what's the for... actual PC term now? But there is there is a troupe of circus performers... Yes. ...that are... What, I literally don't know what the term is anymore. Midgets, little people... I, they're, they're the most amazing things. They're the, so funny and so the, good in this. I mean, they are billed in, in this movie as um you know the troop of midgets and obviously nobody says that anymore no. um no but yes we all know what you mean but there so between honestly between i don't think i've there there's not a lot of casting that gets thrown their way and these guys were so good in it um they did some of the most amazing acrobatic stuff uh yeah so at the end during the during the uh, the battle when the rebels finally get into the castle they're trying to take it over and then there's just like the guards that keep getting knocked out and then there's just a line of guys like laying on their backs with their feet in the air like moving the guys down the line to the catapult to like throw them into the ocean it just it's such a small thing but it's like they cuz they literally did not need to include that at all and it was probably one of my it was it was one of the things that I remember watching as a kid and just like being like, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, they were they were great in the sort of I mean, I suppose it's not the opening song, but it's kind of like the first song in the actual movie. Never outbox um, the fox. Yeah, never. Which, again, is it's kind of this fast paced song it's, that Danny yeah, Kaye sings. All of the songs are very fast paced, um, except for like a handful. The one that he sings uh, when they get stuck in the rain and they have to go into the the barn and he has to sing, yeah. you know, the future king to sleep. That's actually a song that my mother used to sing to me as a child. I'll see. So it's, it's a, a, it's a it's very sweet, together. very beautiful song about falling asleep. And it's super cheesy, but it's so beautiful. And I love it. And it's Danny Kay singing. Like, he's just, just got such a great voice. So, um, when you go to sleep tonight, will you be putting that on with your headphones and just having Danny Kay serenade I, you to sleep? I, I absolutely should. Um, you should? He's very calming. Um, <laughs> but all of the songs that he sings, I think for that one, are very fast-paced. The opening song during the credits, I, I actually... It. I kind of miss how movies used to open like that. Like with just like a little bit of like a little bit of frivolity and fun. It's um and also completely they did silly. It, it's I mean it it sets the tone for the movie completely. My favorite um, thing about that opening credits is not only the fact that you have Danny Kay just stood in the middle of the screen singing while the credits sort of appear around him and then he's just sort of like pushing each individual credit away and pulling them in and moving them around and stuff like that getting but also pushed down by them getting pushed down by them whenever whenever he says the word villain in the whole song basil rathbone's name just comes back up <laughs> <laughs> and it comes up like four it's times <laughs> he's just so like true. "Ooh, basil rathbone and again <laughs> Yeah, it's just and we get it, things. movie. It's just great, it's, though. But it's it. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing subtle about this movie. There's nothing secret. There's nothing that they have to like that you have to figure out. Like it is literally the, no. all of the plot points are given to you. You don't really have to think. You just have to follow. And I really love that you don't. That this is a movie that you can turn on and watch and just enjoy like you don't have to focus on anything or be like oh my god that's what they meant when they said this or like oh that's what that that's what that spinning top means because inception is still in my yeah. brain but it's like 
it's one of those things that like you can just literally turn your brain off put this movie in and just enjoy it for being lovely and rachel like, a lot of the times those are people's favorite movies exactly because I they, love are, this they are not only just easy easy to watch they are endlessly fun i will watch this movie so so many more times i will i will watch this movie for the rest of my life if i want a good fun enjoyable laugh for an hour 45 um that makes me so happy but yeah there's you know it's kind of the kind of what i said before about this movie being so unbelievably theatrical in the fact that not only is it kind of like very easy to follow because you know on a, on a on a stage a lot of things t- kind of have to be easy to follow because it's all it, it's live and you know you can't sort of do anything too overly subtle otherwise it's just not going to gr- grasp a, a live audience's attention mm-hmm. um but with that and also the kind delivery of everyone's performances the fact that everything's just so over dramatic and you say cheesy but i i i almost say campy but in in the in the way where camp is never a negative term in my yeah no it's i mean i use cheesy in 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 every positive connotation just because yeah like I, i i love cheesy movies you got to watch them every now and then just to make you feel a little bit better about life. Um, but this movie is just, it's, it's a good feeling, adorable movie. If you just want to turn your brain off for a little bit or just watch something that's happy, like that's actually like happy. You want to watch something yeah. that's actually happy. You've, you've been overly, you, you know, you've been watching so many hard hitting dramas or depressing documentaries or, horrible murder shows or looking yeah looking at facebook (laughs) looking at twitter or another news story about the president what do you want to do you just want to go and watch the court jester just watch and it'll make everything okay for a couple of hours i do love the fact that like when you say musical a lot of people get turned off because they think that people are just bursting into song and there's big dance numbers that take up 25 minutes and that there's no context and it's a very simple story this has one big dance number and it's not even that big and it's um when he's uh, entertaining the troops in the forest with yeah it's with, the opening with, with the carnival of... people yeah, yeah it's it's the uh never out fox the fox yeah um which <laughs> I literally hadn't seen the movie in a, in a really long time, and as soon as I turned it on, I was like singing every line to it because it was that memorable as a child. I mean, but this, like, this it, is something that's... I want to bring up later to you about like one particular quote in this movie. I want to see if you have seen it enough times to actually get the whole thing on the first try. Later. Oh, is it the vessel of the puzzle? Ahead. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Oh no, I've been saying that since I was like six. Um, <laughs> But like, like I said, like most musical numbers, I mean, when you watch, when you watch, uh, White Christmas, yeah, the whole thing is a musical within a musical. So there are going to be big show stopping dance numbers and there's going to be, you know, a lot, not a lot of context within those dance numbers or musical acts. Um, but with this, there are songs that literally do nothing but progress the storyline um, yeah. or character advancement. Like there's no wasted moment. There's also not that 20 minute dance break. There's not a big sweeping like love scene. Um, it doesn't get too serious. It doesn't take itself seriously either. Actually, this is one of my favorite things that I literally learned today. So in the scene where, Danny Kay, as Giacomo, under the witch's spell, goes to Princess Gwendolyn and he offers her everything. My hand, my heart, my yeah. leg, my... Hold on, I gotta find the quote because it's so funny. Um, Does he say, my calf? My, my yeah, calf. my legs, my calves. Um, but it was... Um, 
I don't know where it, maybe not <laughs> soundtracks. Um, it was one of those things that apparently, um, was it too intense for senses? No. Um, apparently, and this is a quote, unimpressed with him in tights, the producers made Danny Kay wear leg falsies to improve the shape of his legs. Oh. This adds a touch of irony when Hawkins offers the princess all of him, including his legs and calves. <laughs> because Danny Kay didn't have great legs? I mean, he had great legs. He just apparently they weren't very... I, I, don't, I don't think he did a lot of squats. He did a lot of plies, but not a lot of... Like, yeah. I so his legs, his legs were not as shapely as they wanted them to be in tights. <laughs> so they had to give him padding. And so it's just, it's, it's, it's a few of those little like digs that like, if you didn't know, you would just kind of be like, well, that's a weird thing to offer someone. <laughs> but then when you find out about it, it makes it that much better. And you realize just how much of a comedic genius Danny Kay was. Cause I'm sure that that was just some throwaway line that he just made up on a sure tape it was. that they decided to keep because it was funny to the creators. And now that we all know it's even funnier. Yeah. I can tell there's probably a lot of stuff like that in this oh, one. I'm, because it seems sure. like literally everybody involved must have just had a great time. Yeah. Well, apparently it took them 11 takes to get the scene where Danny's sitting at the feet of the king and he's getting kicked oh. when Griswold comes in. Yeah. Like that's, the, I think the last the last cut that they did was the one where he switches sides because he, so he's sitting on the king's left and he's you know Griswold is there and he's making up these little like quippy songs of like couplets and uh, every time he says something it's usually a dig at Griswold yeah um, and again like, it's very about, funny it's so funny it's about how like if Gwendolyn marries him like she'll never have to worry about a larder because he's like a big <laughs> he's a big dude and so he calls him like he a is. side of beef or some like a ton of beef and he gets kicked on his right side and apparently after like 10 takes he just had a black mark from like his hip to his knee oh, no. and so he so in the scene that made the movie uh he ends up switching sides he goes do you want to do you want to start in on the side and he goes and he gets kicked he's like thank you <laughs> <laughs> oh guess. my god it's just tiny little things like that that just are so adorable and endearing and he plays a jester which is somebody who is supposed to be funny I mean, yeah, it kind of all fits, and I yeah. I do love his uh, his sort of jester song, um, because he kind of comes into that scene and you think he's kind of all nervous about it. He he might, you know, because King Roderick seems perfectly um, willing to just tell people to you know to sentence people to execution with the snap of yeah. his fingers. He. I, I numerous times in the movie he's just like uh go and hang them yeah <laughs> oh yeah he's go and so, behead them he's so blase about the lives of his people he is he yeah. does not I care mean, he, he at killed all. the royal family well, he did but he does not care at all about the lives of the common people um so yeah but you're thinking then oh god okay and me obviously having never seen the movie i'm then thinking okay is this gonna maybe be like danny k gets he, he comes in as the jester but then because he doesn't do a very good job as the jester does he get put in some sort of jail and then there's all this big escape plot okay mm. maybe that's where i thought it was going didn't go there um but it doesn't and he snaps onto this great song that i'm just i'm, I'm waiting for this sort of okay up until this point we've heard we've heard other characters say that oh this this fellow has ha this fellow has wit, sir, and oh, I Wait, are like you talking him. about the song? Are you talking about the song that he sings when he comes into the castle, or when they're in the hall for the when big they're in meal? the yeah when they're in the hall for the meal? Oh, oh, when when he sings about how he became a jester. Yes. Ugh. Actually, um, there's a little there's a little part of that song um, where he you know he says. Um, I found a bow and arrow. I learned to shoot. I found a horn. I learned to toot. Now I can shoot and toot. And I'm cute. That's actually a, yeah. a line from one of his previous movies that he did. And okay. actually, the most famous thing that happens, the most quotable thing that happens in this movie, which you wanted me to say. Um, I did. You, you wanna, let's say it now. 
okay, Rachel, it's... there is a, a particular uh, piece of wordplay in this movie um, yes. that I, again, was staggered by. Uh, it's just perfect, and I was loving every minute of it. It's also hilarious. <laughs> Um, it's towards the end where uh, Danny Kay and Clark Griswold, I'm going to keep calling him Clark Griswold, there's nothing <laughs> anybody can do about that. Uh, Danny Kay and Chevy Chase have to fight each other for the hand of Angela Lansbury. And yeah. yay, isn't it all great? So, Rachel, yes. what? Go go ahead. Okay, so if you're so, in a, if you're so, so good with this, so a little more backstory to this because it, it, okay, it, okay, you do need a little bit of context to this. So basically, um, Gwendolyn wants to get married to the jester, um, and so yeah, the king doesn't want this to happen. So he wants he wants her to marry uh, Clark Griswold, Clark. <laughs> um, and the only, he devises this way to get him to get his way, and so. He wa- wants to knight the jester, yeah, so that Griswold can challenge him to a duel, meaning that whoever wins, the princess has to marry. So yes, because like only a knight is eligible to marry the princess and all that business. Yes. So yeah. they the knighting process should take four years or five. Uh, they speed him through that in a hilarious. Uh, run yeah. through of yeah. activities for him to do. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's objecting the entire time. <laughs> um, so he finally gets knighted. Um, he has to battle Griswold. Um, but because uh, the witch still wants to live, she, who has been poisoning everyone throughout the entire movie, decides to drop a pellet of poison into one of the goblets before the pre- b- for the drinks before the battle. Um, and they devise this little, this little poem in order for Danny Kay to remember, um, which goblet to drink out of. And it is the pellet with the poisons and the vessel with the pestle. The chalice from the palace has the brew that is true. So he has to repeat this over and over to himself. There and you being go. Danny Kay, he keeps, he keeps forgetting, um, and messing it up. But while he's practicing this, one of Griswold's people is listening. And so he has to remember this as well. And right before, and then, so they're both rehearsing this. And then right as Danny Kay gets it, somebody broke the chalice from the palace. <laughs> oh no, somebody broke the vessel with the pestle. Um, and so they had to make a new one. And so Which now is the flagon with the dragon. The flagon with the dragon. The vessel yes. with the pestles in the chalice from the palace, the flagon with the dragon has the brew that is true. Now, I've been saying these lines <laughs> since I was about six years old. Rachel, um, can you to the teach point where... me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pellet with the poison. The pellet with the poison. Is in the vessel with the pestle. Is in the vessel with the pestle. The chalice from the palace. And the chalice from the palace. Has the brew that is has true. Has the brew that is true. But now yes. the chalice from the palace is broken and the brew that is true is in the flagon with the dragon. No, the pellet with the poison Damn is in it. the chalice with the palace. The f- oh, the pellet with the poison with is the in the chalice with the palace. The flagon with the dragon has the blue that, brew that is true. See, this is why it's so great. And the, <laughs> and the flagon with the dragon has the brew that is true. So what happened to the vessel with the pestle? It got broke. The vessel with the pestle got broke, not the chalice from the palace. I don't remember anymore. See, this is why it's so great and so confusing and so wonderful and so comedic. It's so good because you can talk yourself in circles. But basically, once uh, once I turned 21 and I started going out to bars with my sister, um, we would get two drinks and we would literally get drunk and recite <laughs> that to each other. And it is probably one of my favorite things ever. Um, I and so, think it's a great drunk activity. It's so good because you'd walk over with the two drinks and go, wait, which one's the flagon with the dragon? You'd be like, I want the chalice from the palace. Be like, okay, but which one? Like, it's just fun. It's, but it's, it's also one of those things that got played off of, um, uh, it's kind of an homage to Bob Hope. Okay. Because in the pale face, which is just like, God bless the forties and fifties. Um, (laughs) it's just outrageous. Um, 
Bob Hope is in this Western called The Pale Face, and they do this whole thing about um, one of the guns that he has to go, like, do, like, a, a shootout at the OK Corral, kind of, like, mm-hmm. you know, on Main Street at noon or whatever. Um, and one of the guns that is provided, each gun only has one bullet, and one of them has a blank in it, and the other one has a live round. Yeah. And the gun with the live round has a mark on it, and like it's it's the same kind of premise. Yeah. It's like the pistol, the pistol with or the, the pistol with the mark has you know the the bullet with like it's 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 insane to watch, but it is so funny. And it's the same thing of Bob Hope walking <laughs> to his spot on Main Street saying this, and so it's this okay. nice little like homage to that. Um, a lot of people claim that it is a like a, a vaudeville thing that it got pulled from vaudeville. Mm-hmm. Which I absolutely agree because it just it of, has that feel to it. Yeah, of course um, it is. So it's just yeah, it's just one of my favorite things. Like I like I said, I've been saying those lines for forever, and it's I just it's it. so entertaining. Oh, and like the whole fact that while all of this is going on, Danny Kay is in his suit of armor that had been struck by lightning and is now <laughs> magnetized. <laughs> And so he's walking shoulder to shoulder with Clark Griswold and he's just constantly like leaning over and like attaching himself to Clark and like, and then like they're standing there and uh, uh, Griswold's helmet keeps getting attracted to, to, to uh, Hawkins and like they pull, he pulls it back and it just keeps going. It is the funniest thing that they have to focus on so many bits at the same time while everything else is going on around them and they're saying their lines and they're doing their physical comedy and they're trying to keep a straight face and like look worried and it is just one of the most magnificent scenes and everybody else is just looking at them like they're crazy and it's so funny all that whole that whole uh scene kind of epitomizes this movie for me Really in its in its silliness, but in it also in its quality of performing, and yeah. this isn't just acting that's going on here. This is everything. This is purely this is pure performance. This is why I said it's a very theatrical movie because theater performers need to do more than act. And, Absolutely, they have to you know, act and react and do everything else that is included. And I think that we really do need to give a shout out to Robert Middleton, who plays Sir Griswold. And he is just a giant booming man. That is just so good. Like he was in a ton of movies with like Elvis and Westerns and um, in movies with Elvis. Yeah. 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 He, uh, he did a movie with Elvis. He was also, um, uh, he did like a lot of TV stuff uh, back in like the 60s and 70s too. Like he was in uh, Get Smart and Fair Play and Columbo and Kung Fu. Okay. Like this dude had a crazy awesome career and he just plays this. Like his character is basically like, look, I was told you got a girl I get to marry. She's beautiful. And now you're saying I don't get to like, what? Like, dude, I just made a journey. Like, come yeah. on. So I came all this way. Yeah, I exactly. am. I am marrying this princess. So help me God. But he's also like incredibly sweet about it. Like when he addresses her, yeah, he he's kind like, of is. he's just, he's kind of like this big sweet dude with like this really rough exterior. And he's like telling her how beautiful she is and like how he's going to make her happy. And like, all you can focus on is the fact that, you know, Danny K is sitting at the feet of the King singing these stupid Being little couplet songs. And it's so fucking funny. But also um, we, we also love Angela Lansbury in that situation for just saying, no, I don't want anything to do with you. Go away. <laughs> Brut or not, louse or not, it's just, they're just so good. Father, Everybody I will marry for movie. love, and that is all. Yeah. Well, then I will cast my. She's a little bit of a <laughs> drama will, queen, too. I will I cast myself will... off the t- highest turret of the Tur- castle. Yeah, she's just this little bit of a drama queen, and I adore her for that. But, like, honestly, like, with a dad like that, who is also going after Gene the entire time. Oh, he is. And only, he is. Like, yeah. Oh, oh. Who, and Jean is probably younger than his daughter, because um, he, you know, they round, yeah. they, 
they round up the fairest wenches. Mm, wenches. Which he is... does. He does use the word wench an an aggressive amount. Um... I mean, I don't think people use that word enough. I love that word. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really. F- I, I I think it is kind of a fun a, word. I think being called a wench, uh, personally, um, is a, akin to being called a broad. Yeah. Like, I mean, many I people view both terms. of those as negatives, though. Uh, true, but for me, the, when those terms were used, um, when they were coined, um, wench was more of... It, it, it didn't have very many conno- like negative connotations. It was more of like... It was more of yeah. like, hey, that chick. like Yeah, that, I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah, and then broad was used to describe strong, vocal women... Like who would like what female wouldn't want to be called a broad? Like yeah, I am. That's amazing. Like it's like just akin to feminist. Like yeah, sure, of course it, of course yeah. I am. If you're gonna own it, own it. Yeah. So that's I love the, I love the use it. of wench. Um, but they do, they do. Okay, so this is this is one of my cavets about the movie. One of my very very few ones. Um, when <gasps> there's one, there's one. There, Shock. There <laughs> So the king calls uh, for a party to welcome Griswold and basically like they're going to have a tournament. Griswold's showing up and then he's planning on marrying his daughter off to this guy way up north. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and so in order to provide merriment, he basically has the royal guard round up the fairest wenches in the land. Now, not only is that a little bit despicable, it's a little calling for the time, but I mean, we're we're supposed to be in England, right? Yeah, where people are fair of skin. Uh, yes, right? people are fair of skin. They, historically, they round they round up these wenches in an uncovered <laughs> wagon, and then just drive around the countryside for hours with an un like these girls are getting sunburned. They're not going to be very fair with tan lines. It's still there. Yeah. Yeah. But like, that was one of my only cavets. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, cause I'll, I'll, I'll suspend, I'll suspend disbelief for this movie. It's a very and small cover. It is. It's... Um, but again, that's the only one I can have because this movie it's is just so joyful and fun and ridiculous and beautiful and i mean gwen ends up with griswold at the end which is kind of you know yeah she does it it, it, yeah. it fits it works i like it um yeah, because like he's that. a sweet guy <laughs> they they the two of them kind of seemed like they and sure angela lansbury's great yeah okay but that whole romance from the start was the the doing of the witch. Well, and, yes, uh, but she also was just so desperate to get out of that situation that she's like, I'm going to die true. or your prophecy is going to come true. I'm going to throw myself off the tallest turret of the castle, uh, which she Although, says, I think, three times in the whole movie. Yeah, um, probably. But yeah, it ends very, very happily very very joyfully as it should because the whole movie is that did want to bring up uh giacomo himself the real giacomo who uh gets beaten into unconsciousness by um by danny k is uh no, by by... oh that's true I apologize. That just shows how That's much of a true. badass she is because he's such a del like I'm mean, not delicate in a, in a negative way, but he's he's more of like a passive, like he wants to be, you know, he he's there in the group in the rebels to take care of the future king, and he's holding the 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 the, the, the child while you know these recruits are coming through and he's you know showing them the birthmark and he's like, don't you think this would be better suited for a woman? And he's like this is your job. Like, this is the most important job and I'm giving it to you. And then he Mm. sends him and the child in Jean's care, like under her protection to go take him to the castle 
And so when Giacomo comes and interrupts their slightly romantic, no pun yeah. intended, but actual roll in the hay. Um, Legit, though. It's, yeah. Yeah. They're, act- they're actually laying on hay in a barn while they're waiting on a storm. Uh, Giacomo comes in and um, he's basically there, you know, they're trying to figure out a way to become to infiltrate the king and, you know, become uh, be in his inner circle so that they can get a key that would unlock a secret passage from the forest to uh, to the castle so that the rebels can come in and overtake the, the crown. Um, and so Jean or uh, Giacomo is telling them all about himself and Danny Kay goes to beat him over the head with this log almost and yeah. Jean just kind of goes no give it to me like I got this and beats him over the head knocks him unconscious and then they strip him down and uh come up yeah, with he's a never... big uh big plot he's never seen again no no I'm kind of um, worried about him I I just wanted to point out that he's played by John Carradine who is also in the mustache hall of fame <laughs> And also would be for this movie if he wasn't already in there. Absolutely. I almost forgot about that. <laughs> what, what a wonderful tiny cameo from John Carradine. <laughs> As, and I mean, his Giacomo is kind of the Giacomo that everybody at the castle was expecting. He's mm-hmm. dashing. He's very uh, expressive and clearly you know sure of himself yeah sure yeah sure of himself um i think I, I actually think basil rathbone at some point says when he sees uh you know danny k come in as giacomo he says like well this isn't quite what i was expecting from <laughs> yeah. all my sources in europe <laughs> i just uh, i also love his like lackey that's like are you sure that's him <laughs> like he yeah, seems like he? a doofus <laughs> But what a lot of people, if you haven't seen this movie also, um, Giacomo also has another uh, skill, which is why Giacomo was on his way to the castle. Yes. And that is that Giacomo, not only is he the jester, king of jester and jester of kings, he's also an assassin. He is. And, and that, is a, that is a fact that Jean does not understand. <laughs> Jean doesn't under, Jean's never known about that, nor does Danny. Uh, And so he gets kind of sucked into this crazy plot that he has no idea. He thinks that Ravenhurst is his like inside guy for the the rebels when it's actually like a a blacksmith. Um, (laughs) And so he starts plotting and they're both plotting these things that that just happen to kind of sound similar and they both agree to everything. (laughs) And then it's (laughs) it is a comedy of errors. And it is murder and <laughs> betrothal and witchcraft and and like you said before there's there's kind of a lot going on but it is very easy to follow yeah because absolutely it, it, like it is just made that way it's just made very easy to follow for for anybody watching it and well, helped it, of course by the fact that it is kind of pure fun and entertaining well, it's also super easy. Like, um, so one of the, one of the uh, the instrumental things uh, that ever got taught to me was in my freshman year English class, and we read um, the Great Gatsby, and we did a study mm-hmm. of what color meant. You know how Daisy okay. was always in white because that's how Jay viewed her as pure, and like yeah. all of this. So now when I watch movies or like read books, like I very much pay attention to what people are wearing or what the tone is around them. And so you watch this movie and Ravenhurst is always in black. Yeah. Because he's a bad guy. So is the witch. She's always in black. Um, Danny Kay is constantly changing colors because he doesn't know who he is. And each character mm-hmm. has its own set of colors. And it's just one of those wonderful things that like that just helps reiterate the point of and the use of like the technicolor in this because everything is so bold and so bright and so beautiful that yeah. like you can't help but be like, oh, I may not know what's going on exactly, but I know that that guy's wearing black and he's a bad guy. Like, yeah, I mean, you, you are you are speaking my language now. I love color. 
I love knowing what colour means. I love reading into colour in movies. Um, you know, it, with with stuff like that, the, the villain being in black, you always see a lot in westerns. Uh, mm -hmm. very older older westerns villains got a black hat on heroes got a white hat on that's what made you know um certain darker certain spaghetti westerns kind of more interesting because the heroes or the anti-heroes were all of a sudden wearing black hats and everyone was kind of gray and it's just mm -hmm. that that that's the kind of thing there but yeah i completely agree with you it's uh it's it's an it's I love looking at colour. It's why I love these really lavish technical uh, productions because they are just uh, they're beautiful to look at, but Absolutely. also all that beauty is also telling you things yeah, that maybe you, you don't realise at first. Like, but you, but subtly you recognise you. Like, it yeah. may not be in the front of your mind, but like subconsciously you recognise these exactly. things because exactly. it's 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 something that's been used time and time again forever um and it still happens today like uh, like it spies does. are dressed in black not just because you know they work in the dark of night and don't want to be seen but because they're usually bad guys like there's very subtle things about it you know um there is, or the, there is. and the use the use of uh costumery like uh if if somebody wears gloves they're a bad guy because it's something that they're hiding yeah. Which is a big deal. Uh, I hate to say it, but Frozen uses it perfectly. Like, okay. Anna, Anna wears her gloves because she's hiding who she is. And then when she goes into the mountains to, you know, let it go, she literally rips her gloves off and lets it go and lets herself be who she is. Hans is a bad guy who has all of his, his who has his gloves on, who only takes them off when he's revealing how bad he is when he goes to kill, um, uh oh wait yeah Elsa's the one with the gloves yeah my brain is working um <laughs> but it's it's <laughs> one brain. of those subtle it's one of those subtle things that even children know and can recognize um so I love that part about it your brain is way too focused on <laughs> this one movie right now I, I think I love Rachel this movie. it makes and me so happy maybe this is also just me being uh, biased to the older movies and having that, you know, unconditional love for those as opposed to uh, newer stuff. But I just don't think that newer movies use colour and use costume quite like they used to in, oh, no, in but, productions but again, like, like this. But again, a period piece is so much easier to, you know, utilise that because there's so much more. I mean... But then again, you can, like, if you pay subtle attention to, um, I know that this is a hot topic for a lot of people, but even in TV, like, the Big Bang Theory, like, each character is very, okay. is dressed very specifically. Um, you know, Leonard has a lot of layers in him that he keeps hidden, and so he's always got, like, a t-shirt and then a, and then a hoodie and then a jacket because he's trying to keep himself concealed. Um, uh, was it, uh... What what's the one? Howard has a uh, a dicky and in everything, and his belt buckle is always um, a commentary on what is happening in the episode. Like it's very, it's very subtle, and it's not as obvious nowadays. But it's one of those things that if you really wanted to dive in to anything that is being produced now, you can. Yeah, especially I guess. like Spike Lee movies. Spike Lee uses. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uses yeah. costumery amazingly well like everything not just costumery but like set pieces everything mm. is a comment on what the scene is about and that is stunning and but all of that came from and was heavily influenced by movies like the court jester yeah. and everything else vertigo it because oh vertigo hitchcock, uses color hitchcock was outstanding a master at it like he was one of like he was one of the guys who was the first to use bold color in that aspect and it was just it was stunning the color is a big reason why vertigo has gone so far up the rankings in my hitchcock favorites over mm -hmm. the past sort of few years um and i mean we're not talking about that today but uh maybe you've just enlightened me as to some actual depth in the big bang theory which <laughs> i didn't think was there um so i, I guess 
fair play that show that has actually ended now i believe i don't know i don't keep up yeah with after things. like 13 12 seasons I don't after know, I didn't way too that. long um <laughs> But this Ray, movie is so good. I highly recommend it. <laughs> is so good. I know you could probably go on for several more hours about the court jester. And to be honest with you, Rachel, so could I. But we want to keep this episode to a reasonable length of time. Um, but is there any big, major... Is there anything, actually, that you haven't said that you really, really wanted to say that is um... sort of not in a summary sense uh, go watch the schmodown <laughs> go watch the schmodown is a fair statement um, um with big promoters yeah, got... of the schmodown on this podcast feed I, I just i also one of the things i love about the schmodown is that it, it does pay homage to older movies um not does it as though? much as i mean it it does bring up movies that a lot of people will go huh and it will require them to look up, and so I, oh, sure, I hope sure that... that's true. But mostly yeah. for me, those movies are from the two thousands. <laughs> that's true. That's fair. So that's fair. any, <laughs> but I mean, we're working on it. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 uh, and I'm pretty sure I actually brought this up maybe last week, maybe on Morgan hasn't seen. Um, I think me and Janine. I think it was when me and Janine were talking about the collision. Yes. Um, about how there's so many questions in the Schmodown that come from movies this side of 1990, unless you get a specific 80s, 70s, or classics category. Uh, now, yeah, I mean, I want to see think... round one questions about the damn court jester, Rachel. I would. I want to see that. Well, not only do in I the want court to see jester. One... I mean, to be fair, for me, I would rather have them be round f uh, three, like, five-point questions that I get, because then I could finally win. Um, that would be well, really all... lovely. <laughs> I mean, that's also true. <laughs> but... It's like every time I get into round three, I'm like, oh, Disney or musicals, come on! I just think there needs to be slightly less questions based on movies from the 90s and the 2000s and more questions based on movies from the 30s, please. Hey, write some questions. I mean, they wouldn't get chosen because nobody never likes know. those movies, apart from me. That is the reason I wouldn't be very good in the schmodown. That's not very true. Uh, well, not that well, you would be good. Really like not that you'd those. be the only one liking them. I mean, Roko loves them, and Draco loves them. No, I misspoke Depending saying that nobody the... likes them. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I just no. Think... I mean, I I have yet to meet a bigger fan of movies made before 1970s than you. That's such a that's such a sweet thing to say. <laughs> Rachel, Morgan, you're gonna make me cry. Yes, cry, cry from my love. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a damaging thing. <laughs> I don't think I've said anything more on brand for me. Cry for my love. What a cry what a good way to end. Love. Let's end the. Um... <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. But Rachel, go see the court jester, guys. Go look up Danny yes. Kay. Uh, watch all of his stuff. He is a gem and a wonder. Uh, he also had a TV show, a variety show, that apparently they used, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Life Could Not Better Be, which is what the song okay. opens and, or the movie yeah. opens and closes to that song. Uh, apparently that was the theme song for his variety show. So go check, go try and find it on YouTube. And uh, I mean, Danny Kay is a gem and a, and a treasure. So, I mean, watch everything. I Enjoy. And I entirely agree. Rachel, I remember the kind of maybe the first time we ever properly met. You told me this was one of your favorite movies. Um, it is. Leonard so. Maltin and I had a very wonderful discussion about this. Leonard and Alice and I. This um, is perfect. The, it was, uh, we yeah, we had a very lovely giggle-induced uh, discussion about this movie at Villains, uh, was it Scum and Villainy? And, yes. Uh, 
He is. He was. That was where I was thinking. That was the same place. That was the same. He was. He he was very impressed that I not only knew of the movie, but like knew the movie, and we had a a very lovely chat. And he is one of my favorite people to talk to about this. And now you, because now you understand the love and have that have that deep appreciation. So come out Um, and uh, you and Leonard and I can sit down and watch this and pontificate. Well, that would be a true highlight of anyone's <laughs> existence ever. Um, Rachel, thank you for picking this movie. Absolutely. Uh, because it, it meant that I got to discover this movie. Um, and that is what we love doing on It's a Wonderful Podcast. We love discovering the old movies that uh, one of your good friends may love. And you might think, huh, what is that movie? And then they say to you, go and watch the movie. So you watch the movie, you record a show about it, and you end up loving the movie. And that's what it's all about. What do you mean Clint Clint Eastwood's in a musical? Exactly the same. I mean, (laughs) admittedly, I preferred this one quite considerably to Paint Your Wagon. (laughs) Um, But still, just as... Paint Your Wagon, weird movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but we, we I like I like to bring the uh the not so uh renowned movies uh and most namely musicals into the life of others. So, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And that is why that is why uh that's why we love you. I hope next time you are on the show it may be another musical because I would hey, love to. I love musicals. I really do. I am getting such a maybe Maybe it has something to do with becoming such good friends with you. But oh, am I rubbing off on you, Morgan? Maybe. Maybe your musical yeah. loving heart is uh, rubbing off on me slightly. And Excellent. hell, I'll take it. I like that yeah. because I'm having fun watching such movies. And I have, I've always enjoyed, plethora- I have always enjoyed I have a, musicals. Um, I have a plethora of movies for you to enjoy then. Yeah, I've always enjoyed musicals. I mean, like I'm, I've said many, many times on 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 this show, on maybe Morgan hasn't seen too. Um, Oliver from nineteen sixty eight is one of my all time favorite movies. And, oh, absolutely! Uh, as is Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, which also stars the great Angela Lansbury. Angela Lansbury. I watched that about a month ago, and guess what? I just found on DVD literally yesterday. Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. Chitty chitty bang bang. Chitty chitty bang bang. Yes. Okay. Dick Van freaking Dyke. Love him. But yeah, maybe we'll do that one next. Maybe we will do that one next. Who is to say, Rachel? I'm sure you'll be back very very soon. I would love on that. this glorious show. That is it. That has been episode sixty three of It's a Wonderful Podcast. You can find the show. On Apple Podcasts, where you can leave your five-star rate and reviews because it's great. And Rachel will come to your house and scream the vessel with the pestle situation (laughs) at you uh, aggressively for the rest of the day if you do not leave a five-star rate and review. But maybe you want that to happen, so maybe she won't do that if you don't leave a five-star rate and review. Either way, please do that. Please leave one because it really helps the show out. And we'd love you forever. Um, you can check out all. You can check out the show also on Spotify, on Stitcher, on Podbean, Castbox, Google Podcasts, and various other podcast providers. Keep an eye out for the upcoming. Uh, I should say, keep an eye out for the new series on Morgan hasn't seen new upcoming series. We're going to be talking about Fast and the Furious movies, which. <clears throat> Mm-hmm, I'm still not kind of too keen about, but you know, still Janine's happy about it. Um, we also did our bonus movie to end our Will Smith Men in Black series uh, this past Wednesday. That was on Independence Day. Yes, it was my first time ever watching Independence Day. I'm British. It's not a thing here. Uh, just saying Rachel's face has gone so very <laughs> horrible right now. The show no, is called Morgan so Hasn't good. Seen for a Reason. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen any movie that we do on that show. That's why we do that show. Uh, that's why Janine likes to force me to watch things, and for some reason I let her do that. Um, I mean, it helps it's me as well, so it is good for me. 
just like watching this movie was good for me as well. You can find the show also on Twitter at It's a Wonderful One. Find me on Twitter at the Purple Dawn with a three instead of the E in the because three is the magic number. Or on Instagram at just the Purple Dawn. Rachel, where can the good people find you? What are you up to? What are you doing? Yay. Uh, I just had an exhibition match for the Disney uh, Schmodown. Uh, Ooh, when's that up? Air. It's actually up, but it's only for patrons. So if you have donated a oh, dollar or more, please go on. You can access back uh, episodes, and it is so much fun. Um, I wish that I could do... I wish that all of my matches were Disney exhibition matches. because I, I will be so going watching fun. that one today. Um, I also have um, my singles debut will be coming out soon. Um, yeah. So um, that, that match will be, I don't know when, but it was a blast. Um, watch everything that the Shmodan does. Go support them. Like, comment, um, everything um, as you would do for this podcast because this is a wonderful podcast to be <laughs> on. I love <laughs> it every time I'm on here, uh, mainly because, Morgan, you are one of my dearest friends and it is lovely to get to talk movies with you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at R.M. Silvestrini. It's R-M-S-I-L-V-E-S-T-R-I-N-I. Follow me. Boom. I don't post, but I'm funny when I do. So. <laughs> Follow me. I don't post. It's a good advertisement there, Rachel. Well done. It's true. Well I post done. when when I when I do post, it'll make a giggle. So, come follow well, that's me. That's all. That is all we can ask for. You've been so sweet to me today, and I can't handle any much more. I know. It's too I'm sorry. Much. It's too much. I, I don't know what love. to do. <laughs> <laughs> what a good place to finish. Until next week, guys, where, well, hell, I don't know what we'll be doing for episode 64. You'll have to wait and see, but it's going to be another fun one. Uh, yeah, until then, guys, from me and the great Rachel Silverstreet. Bye. Bye.